noche. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Good evening. My name is Inés Figueroa. I'm the director of Latin Women Association. Yeah. Mi nombre es Inés Figueroa y soy la directora de la Asociación de Mujeres Latinas en Brockton. Bienvenidos a todos. Bienvenido. Welcome. Welcome. I'm so happy that this is going to happen. Estoy muy contenta de que esté esto aquí presente hoy. Todo el mundo presente, estoy muy contenta. Um, a ver si podemos hacer algo por Brockton. Un cambio. Necesitamos un cambio aquí en Brockton. Bueno, uh, ahora le voy a dejar con el señor Pablo Calderón y el señor Dan Gibson. Ellos son los facilitadores de, esta, de este programa hoy, esta noche. Ellos van a hablar y van a obtener las preguntas y todo, ¿ok? I'm going to leave you with Pablo Calderón. He's one of the group, uh, facilitator, and David Gibson. He's going to be facilitating too. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, say your name for No. Okay? So, enjoy it. Pregunten. Ask questions if you have for the political, for the candidates in that table. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Anything, let me know. I'll be around. Thank Pablo you. Calderon. Woo! <laughs> Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I want to thank Maria Alamo uh, and, I'm and Inet Figueroa for inviting me uh, to be your MC tonight. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, primero, le quiero dar la gracia a Inet Figueroa y a Maria Alamo por invitarme esta noche para estar con ustedes compartiendo. Mi nombre es Pablo Calderón, yo trabajo en MassDOT, uh, MBTA, en Boston. Yo soy el asistente de la Secretaria de Transportación, uh, Secretary Pollock. Uh, primero, uh, first of all, before we start, I want to thank the candidates. I'd like for them to please uh, stand up, introduce themselves before we start any questions or anything else. So we'll start on the far left there. Hi, my name is Ray Henningsen, and I'm running for Ward 7 School Committee in the city of Rockford. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Angel Cosme, and I'm running for Ward 2 uh, City Councilor of the great city of Brockton. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Zygmunt. I'm running for Ward 6 City Council. First of all, I want to welcome all of you uh, for taking the time to spend with our community tonight. It really sends a wonderful message to our community. Not only do you, are you looking for our votes, but you also are respecting us by coming out here and listening to what are some of our concerns. Le estaba diciendo a los candidatos que le quería dar las gracias por estar aquí esta noche con nosotros y también por darnos respeto como una comunidad latina para que ellos puedan oír exactamente cuáles son uh, las cosas que nosotros queremos hablar con el cual pregunta tenemos y cuáles son uh, los issues que nosotros queremos hablar con ellos. Um, before I, uh, I get started, I, I wanted to give you a quick little background because I hear this all the time. How did Latinos get to Brockton? Because that's very important for the candidates, it's very important for us. As you will know, Latinos have been part of the American fabric since the beginning of time. In the West, when we say Latinos, we're talking about our Mexican community. Right now, the, our, our Mexican community in, uh, in California comprises 19% of the population in California. And the largest Latino state is New Mexico that has 50% of its population that's Hispanic. Now, when you come to the East Coast, in the East Coast, your two largest communities are your Puerto Rican community and the Dominican community. In 1989, the United States took over Puerto Rico as part of the Spanish-American War. In 1919, it, they, we, Puerto Rico received citizenship, but limited citizenship. We could talk about that later. Now, what's important is 1950. 
in 1950, it's called the Great Migration. We had 60,000 Puerto Ricans come to New York in one year. The reason the war was going on, the Great Depression, and you know, as we say in Puerto Rico, if the United States gets a cold, we get a pneumonia. So you could imagine the, how the depression impacted Puerto Rico, and, but most importantly was the advent of travel. Tra planes were available. Before that, all of us had to come by boat. So as soon as in 1950, as soon as uh, aviation was available, we had 60,000 Puerto Ricans come to New York in one year. From there, we kept coming 30,000 every single year. Right now, we are 21% of New York. Also, here in Massachusetts, we are 15% of the Commonwealth here. So, what happened was, folks went to New York. I'm going to make it very briefly. Then from there, they went to Connecticut. The reason we went to Connecticut was the tobacco fields in in, uh, in Connecticut. And of course, tobacco was one of the main agricultures in Puerto Rico. Then from there, we went to Greenfield, Pittsfield, to the apple orchards. Then we created the Springfield community. Then from there, we went down to Lemonster, um, Fitchburg, and we created the Worcester community. As we stayed, we kept creating communities. Then we moved over to Framingham. The reason we moved over to Framingham was because of the agriculture and also the manufacturing at Denison Factory. So, and then from there we moved to Natick, to the apple orchards, and years later we moved to the south end uh, called Viva Victoria. At Viva Victoria, uh, most of you moved to Dorchester, Mattapan, Jamaica Plain. The reason you're here in Brockton is housing. The cost of housing, as our, our, as our elected officials need to hear. We're, we came here not to live on programs. As you can see, all of us came here looking for better opportunities and work. And the second thing is housing and education for our children. So once uh, housing became too expensive in Boston, we began to move out to Low Lawrence. That's why the largest community today is in, in Lawrence. It is a Dominican community. Now, you're seeing a lot of people moving to, to Brockton, New Bedford, Fall River, and again, it's because of housing costs and maybe some job opportunities here. So, as you can see, housing is very important to us, and of course, jobs. So we've been here since the 50s, and we will continue to be here. We are a main fabric. As you can see, we're a young community. We, we are the only growing community. We're the only ones contributing to the growth of Massachusetts. Last year, we contributed 34% to the growth versus 7% of the general population. So you could see how important our community is, and that's why our community has to work with our elected officials to ensure that our needs are going to be met and that also that we are part of their uh, administration uh, and that their staff also reflects us. So I just wanted to give you that quick background because it's very important how Latinos got here uh, for all of us and especially for our politicians to really understand that we are here looking for opportunities. Also, we're not a monolithic community. There's 22 countries that speak Spanish and we're all different. Our, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Hillary Clinton found that out. She was dealing with immigration. Immigration only dealt with part of our community. There was still a lot of other issues that confront our community. So when you're looking at the Latino community, you can't say uh, Puerto Rican. No, all of us, there's 22 countries and all of us have different needs and different wants. The only thing we have in common is the American dream and language. Those are the only thing that we have in common in those 22 countries, the American dream and language. For the uh, forum for this evening, we will have some rules to help keep things in order and to keep things moving on. And this is for uh, everyone. Please listen. 
Uh, the forum is a civic engagement educational forum. The purpose is to educate the community about who is running, for what elected office, what district, and most importantly, your views about the various issues and why you should be uh, elected. Okay, uh, I'll do it in Spanish. Okay. La razón para esta reunión es para, número uno, educar la comunidad. ¿De quién son la gente que están corriendo para posiciones electivas? También, uh, ¿qué es importante para ellos? ¿Cómo ellos ven issues que nos afectan a nosotros en nuestra comunidad? The uh, forum is nonpartisan, that is, it's not uh, democratic, or, or democratic, republican, or independent uh, oriented. Aquí no estamos si usted es democrático o republicano, ese no es el propósito de esta reunión. Uh, there will be a total of five questions in which each candidate will have the opportunity to answer. Um, when one of the moderators, one of us will, will call your name. Okay. To todos los candidatos van a recibir cinco preguntas. Uh, la pregunta puede estar preguntada por Dan o por yo. Uh, since we, we originally uh, had anticipated many more candidates, and we had a two-minute uh, ruling with regard to your response time. I think we could probably move up to maybe two and a half or three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Is it reasonable? Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. And um, the moderators will keep time and we'll be very strict. So I know that, that politicians that you guys love to talk. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my good. Okay. Um, dice que um, cada candidato va a tener uh, dos do minutos y medio para contestar su pregunta. Uh, y uh, si no Dan o yo, después de los dos minutos, le vamos a tener que uh, decir, se terminó su tiempo. Okay, and at the end of the five minutes, uh, excuse me, at the end of the five questions, each candidate will have uh, two minutes, two to three minutes to wrap up uh, with regard to why they would like to be elected to office. It's a, it's a sum up, if you will. Okay, uh, después de las cinco preguntas, todos los candidatos van a tener una oportunidad de dar, darle un minuto para uh, dejarles saber o, a, o cualquier otra cosa que no se, se discutió en las preguntas. Okay. And these particular uh, rules are for the community, for the other participants, the community of participants. Please be respectful to all candidates, even if you disagree with their responses. Remember, we are here to learn and you will make your decisions with your vote, actually. Uh, okay. Para la comunidad, por favor, uh, respeta a todos los con, ca, candidatos. No importa si la, uh, lo que ellos están diciendo, ustedes no, no, no están con ustedes. Y también que nosotros estamos aquí para hacer una decisión para quién nosotros vamos a votar cuando llegue el tiempo. And translation is available in uh, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean. So if you need help in terms of understanding, please ask uh, one of the people here, Maria and Elsa. You, you got a lady here. Where's the young lady from Haitian Creole? Oh, there you are. Okay. okay. Great. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, tenemos aquí gente que, que le pueden ayudar si necesitan uh, 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 Haitian Creole o en español. Uh, pero también yo voy a tratar de hacer lo más posible si hay cualquier persona que está aquí que no entendió la pregunta o algo, por favor, dígalo en español y yo lo digo en inglés, uh, porque queremos su participación, por favor. And we will uh, push to get you guys out of here on time, and uh, therefore we ask that all participants, please hold your questions till the end, and we will let you know when there will be an open mic for your direct questions to the candidates, okay? Okay. Um, lo, lo que digo es que vamos a tratar lo más posible y empezamos un poquito tarde de terminar en tiempo para que ustedes puedan salir aquí en tiempo. Uh, ahora vamos a empezar, si está bien con ustedes, las preguntas a los candidatos. And lastly, we thank you so very much for coming out and do hope you uh, enjoy this forum. Le, le queremos dar las gracias a todos ustedes por su tiempo y más importante, espero que ustedes estén uh, contentos con lo, con lo que está pasando esta noche y espero de repetir algo o, otra vez. Okay. Okay, um,
first question to the candidates is, what is your affordable housing agenda for the city of Brockton? And how are you looking at the Latino community uh, housing needs, which are the needs of the general public, uh, but how do you see some of uh, the, the greater housing needs that are existing in the Commonwealth, and what are you going to be doing to ensure that any new development has affordable units? So I won't take up much of the time because I am running for school committee, so that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, I can't really answer too much on that question for affordable housing. Uh, the city council candidates can do that. Um, I can tell you a little bit about myself. I serve on the Conservation Commission currently. Um, so one of the charges that we have, one of the duties that we have, is to make sure that any new development that comes forth meets the Wetlands Protection Act and meets those standards and make sure that we have, um, we, we protect our environment. As far as affordable housing goes, you know, I, I, I know that it's an issue statewide. It's an issue citywide. It's an issue nationally. You know, um, inflation um, has been relatively low, but wages have been stagnant. So we don't have higher wages to pay for the rents that is being asked, for the mortgages that are being asked. I was fortunate I bought my house in 1996 at the low end of the real estate market and was fortunate to pay only $90,000 for, for my house. This allowed me to pay a mortgage of about $1,000 a month. Now, I see, you know... Rents twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month, and it amazes me how anybody can can afford that. Any working family can afford that. So, for me, one of the things we need to do is focus on education, so we can get better jobs, so we can make more money, so we can afford these houses. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I don't really have a whole lot on on a plan for for that because it's not really a, a school uh, committee issue. First of all, um, thank you everybody for, for coming. It's quite the big crowd considering there's only three of us up here, but for each and every one of you who came out, thank you for being here to, to listen to the candidates and be informed. Um, I, you know, I, I've been, first of all, when, when I thought of the question, I have a, and I'm not saying this to, to, to make any other point except to highlight how hard it is for people to make a living in Massachusetts and Brockton. I have a master's degree and I oftentimes feel like I'm just getting by, paycheck to paycheck, with uh, several degrees myself, right? Um, I have an apartment that's close to $1,000, and, and there's problems within that apartment that I won't mention for the sake of lack of embarrassing myself and, and the tenants. Um, so it's a real issue. It's definitely a real issue. So um, what I've been doing every single day is knocking on doors, meeting voters for weeks on end. And the conversations that I've had, just today I was in a... Uh, uh, elderly residential unit and one of the women who was in her 70s comes out probably on a fixed in income most likely and she says you know I, I said not only am I here to tell you who I am as a candidate but I want to hear what your concerns are um, and she told me you know I, I need a, 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 a unit that is more affordable than what I'm paying I'm paying eleven hundred dollars I think she said and she said come out here look look at the rug look at the rug look how dirty it is um, so I am all for affordable housing. I, I would like to increase the threshold of how many units are allocated to be designated as affordable housing. I know that in the city of Brockton, there are, there's some controversy around units that are being proposed here in the city. And there's a lot of backlash about what the taxpayers are going to pay as a result of these units. Um, and ignoring the, not even the middle class, but the, but the poor people that are in the city who just need a place to live. And so I'm all for affordable housing, but to answer your question, specifically to increase the threshold, um, to make it a percentage that is equitable to the amount of people who need that kind of assistance. Uh, similar to what Ray was saying, I'm, I'm totally promoting the Raise Up Massachusetts campaign, which is an increase in, in the minimum wage uh, eventually to make it $15 an hour. I think if more people made more money, then it would be easier for us to, to pay things like rent and to make a living in, in Massachusetts, specifically here in Brockton. Voy a tratar, eh, um, el punto es para um, subir, no sé decir threshold, pero hay una cantidad de, de en cualquier edificio, hay una cantidad de, de um, dormitorios o, o de lugares que son designados um, 
affordable housing, que son menos el costo del resto de, de, de los que están viviendo en, esa, en ese lugar. Solo que yo um, voy a luchar para hacerles eh, subir la cantidad de esos apartamentos. So, si es 10%, vamos a subirlo a 20 para asegurarnos que, que todo el mundo te, tenga la oportunidad de vivir en un lugar um, que es uh, affordable. Right? Además, además, apoyo el, 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 el eh, subir el costo de ahora, eh, cuando uno trabaja son 11 dólares a la hora. Yo quiero a subirlo a 15 dólares a la hora para que nosotros podamos vivir y sobrevivir en el estado y específicamente en Brockton, Massachusetts. Thank you everybody for sharing your time here with me this evening. Um, my mom and dad came over from Poland in the 1970s, specifically to Brockton because it was an affordable community and because they were looking for opportunity. Um, I used to live in an apartment in the village um, and it was tough for my parents to, hello, <laughs> it was tough for my parents to make a living. Um, so I definitely know what people go through who work on minimum wage and what they do and the sacrifices that they make, especially to raise their children. My parents put me through Catholic school. I went to St. Edwards here in Brockton um, and to Fontbonne Academy in Milton. Um, and it was incredibly difficult for them to, to pay for tuition. Um, so I wholeheartedly support the effort to make housing in Brockton as affordable as it can be. Um, I do believe, however, that we need to look at, especially in Ward 6, there are a lot of residents who are older, senior citizens, who own their own homes, but they're on a fixed income. And property taxes keep going up and up and up, and our water bills keep going up and up and up, which everybody experiences as well, too, on the water side. Um, so I think we need to, in the city, look overall across all of these issues to see what we can do to maintain a community that welcomes, especially entrepreneurs, people who want to start their own small businesses, um, people with young families, these are the people that are really looking for housing that they can, that they can manage and still provide it, you know, for their families. Um, so, uh, but I do also think that there is a balance between the land that's left in Brockton and what we do with it. So in Ward 6, for example, we have very little land left to do much new development. Um, most of the property is single family homes, but we do have a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot of, but we do have a small percentage of Ward 6 that is rental properties. And I think we need to make sure as well too that we hold landlords accountable for the standards in a lot of these properties. That's a really big issue for me, especially having grown up in the village. I go by there all the time. There, there needs to be accountability for that. There are some unsafe conditions that I've seen people living in. And I don't care what you pay, you should never be living in that, in that kind of situation. Um, yes. So that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Que ella sí va a ser lo más posible que cuando ellos están haciendo vivienda aquí, que ellos están mirando a la necesidad de nosotros, la gente que no son ricas que están viviendo aquí. También ella dice que lo que ella quiere es que los dueños de casa que no están uh, arreglando su sitio o manteniéndolo, que, que la ciudad empiece a ponerle multa a ellos y multa que sea grande suficiente para que ellos le enseñen a los otros landlords que si ellos no empiezan a arreglar le va a pasar lo mismo a ellos, que es algo que nosotros necesitamos porque mucha de nuestra propiedad, es la verdad, nosotros estamos pagando el, uh, mil, dos mil pesos, pero muchas de, de las unidades no, no valen ni mil pesos, ni, ni 500 pesos alguna. Uh, first of all, thank you. I was just letting you know exactly what you said. Right? Uh, now, uh, el, tenemos cualquier pregunta de vivienda, uh, o si no, vamos a la segunda pregunta. ¿Hay alguien aquí en la mesa que le gustaría preguntar algo de vivienda? No? Okay, gracias. The question concerns that of distressed properties that exist in Brooklyn. Is there are a number of them. Do you have a particular agenda or idea in terms of what should happen to these properties? Can you clarify, do you mean um, vacant properties? And abandoned. Vacant and abandoned properties. And abandoned, yes. Yeah, so um, vacant and abandoned properties are a huge problem in Brockton, as we all know. Um, 
I really believe that, so th there's two categories. There are those that are privately owned and those that are actually owned by the city. Um, so let me talk about the city owned ones first. Um, those buildings that are vacant or abandoned that are owned by the city, I believe we should be trying to use those in creative ways temporarily. So for example, some communities in the United States will take vacant retail shops um, and they will rent them out at a very low cost to entrepreneurs or to people who are trying to start a new business. For a very short period of time, that person will be held responsible for maintaining that property. That means making it look good outside, painting the inside, making sure the plumbing works. Um, and in exchange, they get a really good deal on the rent. So it can help small businesses and entrepreneurs develop their business, but it also means that that vacant or abandoned building is being used. Um, some of these businesses will go on to become successful. They might be able to then rent out that property at a full market rate. They might want to purchase that property, perhaps. Um, so I think we need to be looking at creative ways of using these spaces that are owned by the city, for sure. Um, those that are dangerous, I think we need to take down a lot sooner um, and sell a lot sooner than sometimes actually happens in the city. Um, there is, I have requested a list of all the vacant and abandoned buildings. I haven't been able to access that um, as of yet. So there needs to be, I think, some better transparency and communication as well around which ones are owned by the city and what the plans are for them. The ones that are owned by private individuals, I think the city can look at the city council level of how can we better incentivize these folks to, um, to sell those properties or to do something with them. So again, for lots of property, private property owners in other communities do the same thing where they'll rent it out really short term at a really low cost just to keep it updated. That's definitely one idea. Um, but also potentially start looking at a fine system. I know we have some fines in place for vacant and abandoned buildings the longer it goes on, but they're pretty low um, and it takes a long time before it really reaches a threshold that might matter to somebody who owns multiple properties um, around the region. Um, so I think we need to think a little bit outside the box and I think we definitely need to, the information needs to be more accessible as well so that the council can look at it. Are yeah, you working with to ensure that uh, the Latino community knows about these opportunities for uh, some of our businesses that might be interested in some of these distressed um, buildings as you described? So I, this is my first time running for a public office, um, so I'm not yet an elected official. Um, so I haven't um, really been able to engage with anybody or with any community group apart from the process of learning what people's concerns and ideas are in my campaign. Um, I think if I were to be elected, um, I know that the association that's hosting the evening, the event here this evening is definitely one avenue to engage the community. Um, and there are multiple avenues as well too. I think there are a lot of um, groups at the high school as well too that could be engaged on these, especially the entrepreneurial and small, small business side of things. Um, I could talk about that forever, but there are a lot of resources okay. in the city. Uh, you young man. Sure, sure. Um, first of all, I want to make a, a, a point. Um, I can't help but be a little bit dismayed at, at I know we have um, many candidates, and there's only three up here. And it seems to me that um, they're not taking the, the, uh, the power of the Latino vote serious, and that, that's concerning to me. Um, there are 10% of, of the population in Brockton, 10% of the population in Brockton are Latinos. Of that, uh, and this is according to the Mauricio Gaston Institute, which is a public policy um, uh, research organization at UMass Boston, which I am soon to be on the board of, which I'm very proud of that. Uh, they did a, a report a couple of years ago on the numbers in Brockton. So of that 10%, 5,800 are Puerto Rican. And the specific thing about Puerto Ricans, not that they're better in any sense or, or have more value, but they're United States citizens, as you mentioned, right? So they have the vote. Um, and so I just want us to, to know that, that to take the Latino community, the, the Cape Verdean community, everyone needs to be valued equally. And, and I just wanted to point that out. But to answer that specific question, um, I have a very specific idea. And it's not my idea. It's an idea that I heard, and I think it's very practical. In Ward 2, which I'm looking to represent, there is a huge homeless population, a huge, huge homeless crisis, excuse me, um, which bothers me. And it bothers me because there seems to be a lack of compassion to these individuals that are at their lowest. They're, they're not bad people. Like I said, I have a master's degree and I'm paychecks away from, from having my rent 
um, you know, my car repossessed. All those things have happened to me with, the, with multiple degrees. And again, I'm not saying that because I'm better. I'm saying it because I know the struggle. I am from public housing. I grew up in, in, in New York, public housing. And then at age four, I moved to Rhode Island public housing. So I know what it's like to need that kind of uh, in affordable support. So specifically with the homeless population, um, why not take one of these abandoned buildings that the city owns, give it to the homeless population, give those homeless individuals some dignity who have carpentry skills and plumbing skills, right? Give them some dignity and fix it up themselves. Again, I can't take credit. I cannot take credit for this idea, but it makes sense to me. Um, this idea was then proposed to the city council and I think the mayor, and I don't think it went too far, but if I'm on the council, I would totally support that. Let's take all these abandoned buildings, let's fix it up, create a one-stop shop for the homeless where they receive mental health services, substance abuse services, work training, parental classes, and on and on and on, right? That's something that's really practical that we could do with the resources that we have. To answer your question of who is Latino that I'm, that I'm sort of working with, um, I have to give uh, a shout out to Pastor Roberto of the Homeless Improvement Ministry who is working with the homeless population and has proposed this plan. So shout out to Pastor Roberto. En español, ok. Uh, uh, primeramente, el, el poder de los latinos es, es importante y solamente tenemos tres candidatos. Um, en, en Brockton, 10% de los candidatos son latinos. Y um, desde, desde esa popula, población, perdón, um, casi 6,000 son puertorriqueños y los puertorriqueños pueden votar. So es importante que, que los candidatos se, se, uh, que estén de acuerdo del poder de, de la comunidad latina. Um, eh, lo que podemos hacer, hay muchos edificios, perdona que si, si no voy a hablar perfectamente, pero creo que me entienden. Um, hay edificios aquí que son ab abandonados. Si escogimos uno de esos, si la ciudad nos da uno de esos edificios y nosotros, las gentes que, que no tienen dónde vivir, que tienen, que tienen um, skills, eh, que tienen, ayúdame, habilidades en, en transformar ese edificio, eh, plumbing, eh, electricidad, eh, carpentry, si ellos le, le da dignidad a ellos en trabajar en ese edificio, y ese edificio entonces puede ser eh, 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 un lugar donde uh, pueden recibir abu um, servicios de abuso de sustancias, salud de mental, um, clases de, de cómo ser padres, y, y, y cosas así. La ciudad solamente tiene que dar uno de esos edificios a, a ellos y, y se convierte en, 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 en algo bien poderoso para la gente que no tiene donde vivir en esta ciudad. Gracias. Thank you. Um, so, I, I have a couple ideas. Obviously, it's not a, a school committee related issue, um, but you know, some, some in, a, in a way it does relate to schools. Um, so one of the things we, like my other two candidates were saying, we have differences in city owned property and private owned property. As far as city owned property, we currently have two schools, one in, in, in Angel's district that is just sitting there, sitting there collecting dust, doing nothing. Now, there's a lot of problems with that school. When I looked to renovate that school and bring it back online as a real school, it turned out to be cost ineffective. It was, it was too much money. It was $6 million to renovate that school to bring it back up to, to, to code. We have one in my district in Ward 7, the Howard School. That is also too expensive to renovate. So as far as these city properties go, we need to get them out of our hands, sell them at a cheap rate, Give tax incentives to businesses. This goes back to the affordable housing thing. W one of the things that is happening in Boston and, and in Jamaica Plain and various other places that are revitalizing, that, that, are, that are doing well, is we're using what they call a mixed-use property. That mixed-use property is, turns out to be a, a, a triple-decker that they rehab, and on the bottom they put retail stores, and on the top two floors they have you know, residential areas. Uh, that is re reinvigorating those communities because it's putting businesses as well as where you work, as well as where you shop, um, back, back online. That's going to create more jobs. That's going to create more affordable housing even um, by having those mixed-use buildings. As far as, far as private owners go, we need to hold our landlords accountable. 
There was too many absentee landlords in this city. Too many people who own a who own a three family home who don't live here don't care what their property looks like and we need to hold them accountable by having policies in place to find them, to do whatever we have to do to get the Board of Health to shut them down. It is insane and deplorable that people live in some of the conditions they do because we don't hold these landlords who don't care because they don't live here. They don't have to live here. They don't send their children to school here. So we need to have things in place that hold those people accountable and when the City Council and, and people like Angel and Joanne, if they're elected, one of the things that they could do is work on making sure we have teeth in those ordinances to make sure that we make find these guys and, and make sure that they renovate their properties, keep them up to code, and do what they're supposed to be doing because our residents deserve quality, affordable, and safe housing. There you go. <laughs> Do you, I'm here since I'm from Boston, uh, do you have uh, community development corporations here in Boston? Community development corporations, CDCs? Uh, there are community development corporations. I'm not aware of all the, the names. Um, I work for a construction company. Uh, we sell masonry products to, to masons and, and waterproofers, so I'm very familiar with the mixed use properties. Yeah, what, what I wanted to say, in Boston, what we've done is we worked, all the abandoned properties went to community development corporations. Then we had from Suffolk Construction to J.F. White, 11 of the top uh, construction companies in Boston joined teams with the CDCs where they provided some of the labor and to bring down the costs. And of course the CDCs are already working in the community and they also address the issue of uh, homelessness. Uh, so some of the units went to homelessness, some went to affordable families and whatever, but the CDCs and your contractors that are making all this money are the folks that you really need to figure out how do you bring them together because what you're saying happened in Boston for about 20 years. People bought property waiting for it to go up that's why they bought property here in, in Brockton. They're waiting 10 years to come here when everything's a million dollars here in Brockton. But in the meantime, it's boarded up. Yeah. But thank you. All right, uh, we have a, uh, a candidate coming in west. Could you uh, stand up and introduce yourself? Yes, sorry everyone, I'm late. I was, I'm usually late to everything, but I was on time to my forum and it just ran late. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry. I'm Derek Barrels, I'm running for Ward 4 City Councilman. I'm a 24-year-old lifelong Brockton resident, college grad. I went to Spelman, um, graduated in 2016, took a job in finance, quickly realized I hated it, and I needed to work with people, came back to the city, bought a house, um, getting my master's in mental health, and doing my civic duty, running for office, because I'm one of the people that see something wrong, and I'm not going to wait for it. I'm going to go get it. So I'll ask you the current question, is with regard to what are your ideas regarding the distressed property in uh, Brockton? The distressed... Uh, yes, but he's just walked in. Do you understand? Okay. So what are your ideas regarding distressed properties in Brockton? How to use them, how to utilize them, how to address the particular issue? Distressed properties as in foreclosure? Um, I think a part of the problem is that the process of getting them back on the market is too long. We need to speed up this process. We need to make it so, you know, papers aren't just sitting on a desk. We need a quick turnover. I went to a meeting last Monday. In the past six years, I think $4.4 .4 million has been uh, brought back to the city from foreclosed um, properties. That's pretty good, seeing as the administration before that was only $2 million. So we're starting to get more... Uh, politically savvy, we're starting to move forward. Um, in other regards, I feel like we shouldn't even let homes get to those states. I think we need to help people help themselves, keep their families, keep their lives at home, and not even let it get to that. Um, as a new homeowner, I'm quickly learning that mortgage is late one day, they're coming back for you. So. Okay. Um. <laughs>
our next question for the candidates are, what's your plan to improve pre-K, youth programs, and job development programs for the city of Brockton, especially for our youth 14 to 19. Uh, how are you seeing job development, um, and especially for our young, uh, our young folks, pre-K? How are you looking at pre-K enrollment? This is Latino are the lowest in pre-K enrollment in the whole state, and here in Brockton also. So this is, this is something that falls within my uh, knowledge base. I was the, uh, one of the board of directors and treasurer for Brockton Day Nursery. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, how many people have their children attend Brockton Day Nursery. It's one of the oldest daycare providers in the state, over 120 years old. We need, one of the problems in pre-K that we have is a state level issue. We need strong advocates here to pressure our state representatives to create legislation that opens up our voucher system to a larger population. This will allow people to attend pre-K programs at places like Brockton Day, Westfield Child Center, and the various child care providers. We also need to expand our pre-K and our preschool opportunities um, within the city of Brockton. And we're currently starting to do that by we've shifted the dates that you can now enter into our school system, which will allow us to make some small changes in that and allow us to expand that program. But vouchers are really where, where the answer is for, for, for pre-K because there's just not enough. Uh, we have tons of openings at Brockton Day Nursery, but we don't have the, nobody has the vouchers to be able to utilize them. Um, as far as youth opportunities, youth opportunities, we need more jobs for our youth. There's not enough places hiring. Now, I have experience with this because my daughter, when she was 16, went to apply for jobs everywhere, and nobody would hire a 16-year-old girl. Nobody would hire a 16-year-old. They all wanted you to be 17, 18, or older. How is a 16-year-old or a 14 or 15, how are these people supposed to get a job if nobody will hire them? We need to do something to work with our business community to incentivize them to start hiring them. They're responsible. They're more responsible than a lot of us were when I was 16. We need to give them that opportunity. As far as other youth engagement goes, we need to provide more things for our youth to do. You know, I know in Ward 6 we're talking about building a sports complex. Hopefully that will get off the ground. I know I worked with other team members, including Angel here, in, in regards to trying to incentivize businesses to create a sports complex here, which will provide jobs, it will provide opportunities for our youth to utilize soccer, futsal, various sports within that sports complex. The other thing we need to do is we, we need to have more things that they can do educationally. We need to give, we need to open our libraries back up again. We need to give those librarians back into the system in the high school, in the elementary school level, and we need to put them here. The East Side Library is only open, I, I don't know, once, once a week? We need to have our libraries open so that our kids can go and learn, utilize the computers they have. Not everybody has computers and internet at home. But you can utilize those computers to do your homework, to study for tests. It's a safe environment where you can go. You don't have to feel threatened by, by the streets or, or by violence. These are things that you can do to, to, to increase that engagement. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Excellent. I, I love this question, and I could, I could speak way beyond my time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just try to hit. I, I've been uh, a youth advocate for a long time, and I'm somewhat restricted to go into specifics about education because I'm, a, I'm an employee of the city of Brockton as an educator, right? So I can't go into that. I agree that we should expand the, the vouchers. Um, but what I could speak about is what I've been doing with the youth and what I will continue to do and will continue to promote as a, as a youth advocate, as a father of a 15-year-old who lives in the city, who tells me all the time, Dad, Brockton is boring. There's nothing to do in Brockton. And so we need to create such opportunities. So I want to talk a little bit about what I've done um, as a way to show you what I will continue to promote on a, on a higher level. Um, first and foremost, I, I was able to, we have an incredible program here called YouthWorks. 
which employs young people. And um, in, my, in my role, I was able to probably get about 12 students jobs over the summer. Some of them were so good that the employer hired them ongoing, right? So if a, if a person is engaged and working and has the dignity of buying their own clothes and buying their own food, then they're probably less likely to go into, you know, left, the crime avenue or the, or the criminal activity uh, perspective. So that's one thing, job, job opportunities, and, and I've done that. Um, I've also, jobs not jails. I mean, I've, I've been working with jobs not jails for a long time, criminal justice reform. There is a great opportunity here in Massachusetts to create um, uh, criminal justice reform. One specific thing is, is uh, juvenile expungement. When you're young, right, you, you probably get caught up in things. I have as a young person, right? I am not the same youth I was a long time ago. I'm not even going to do the math, um, right? But, but I was given opportunities over and over. And, and I think, right, if, if young people engage in criminal activity and they have the opportunity to get that expunged because they made a mistake when they're young, right, we don't talk about it enough. Core reform is another avenue that we need. There are people coming out of, of the institutions on a daily basis in Brockton, and there's no opportunities for them. Why? Because they're stigmatized. And then what, what do they do? If they can't get a job because of their record, if they can't get housing because of their record, they're going to go back into the streets. So we need to pay attention to the youth that are coming out um, and, and create opportunities for them without the stigma. Um, I mean, I've been a proponent, a proponent for immigration reform. DACA is something that is near and dear to my heart. These are children who've come to um, the United States by their parents, right? So, so I, would, I would protect the immigrant community, I'm sure there's a question on that. I worked at a recovery high school for students in substance abuse. Um, there's a great program here called Breakfast for Brothers. Shout out to, to Jeff Bantu. Every month, it's for actual Breakfast for Brothers and Sisters. It's, it's where um, older, older adults meet with, with younger uh, teenagers who mentor them, right? Um, so that's another opportunity. And um, uh, I've, I've even worked as a mental health clinician working with teenagers. Right, so that's what I've done, and there's many more things I don't want to take up all the time. But I will continue to look for those opportunities and, and, and work relentlessly. I have a son. Our children are the future. And so we need to create such opportunities for, for young people in the city and continue to expand on them. And that's what I will do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a few things on this. So there are actually a few people in this room here today that I've spoken quite a bit to about Ward 6 and our need in the corner of the city for activities and things for children to do. So often there's a focus um, on activity downtown, sometimes in the Campello district, out in Ward 6, not much happens, it's very quiet. Um, we've got three amazing parks, McKinley Park, Tukas Park, and Hillston Park. I wonder how many of you guys have ever even heard of them or know where they are. Two of them are very tucked away um, and not very accessible um, to all folks. I think part of what we need to do is um, look creatively at grant opportunities that are out there and they've started, the city started to do this with McKinley Park, they're getting an amazing Patriots jungle gym set for the kids to play on, they just put in a new basketball court there, um, but Tukas and Hillstrom, massive plots of land, have very little to offer at the moment. So I think we partly need to improve the parks and playgrounds that we do have. Um, and I think we also need to start looking at ways that we can actually get activities to happen there. Um, we have a new director at the library um, who I've spoken to who is very eager to see if we could do outreach programs or library initiatives outside of the library in other parts of the city. It would be amazing to have some of the individual branches of the library. I mean, when I was growing up, I think there was three that were open and accessible to us um, on a full-time basis as kids. Um, I also think that there are a lot of nonprofit organizations, not just here in Brockton and not even just in the region, but even in the Boston area and more widely in Massachusetts and the nation, that do offer a lot of um, programs to help young kids who have dreams. So when I was a young kid, I had dreams of starting my own nonprofit. Um, and I did go on to work in startup nonprofits. And I did that because I had the mentors. Um, and the support and the people who would share their knowledge with me in order to make that happen. There are nonprofits and other organizations out there that do mentoring programs for young kids, and I'd love to see if we can bring some more of those into the city of Brockton. Because I really do think that, I don't know how many of you guys are into fashion at all, obviously I'm not that into fashion, but um, there is a reality show for teen fashion designers, and a young woman from Brockton High School a few years ago got on that reality show. 
um, hugely talented, and we need to be encouraging that and helping them take it further. Not leave Brockton and go do it somewhere, but do it here. Thank you. Next. All right. Like Angel said, I can talk about this all day. I'm as well as admin educator, so we're kind of bounded at what we can talk about. Um, but to start, we need more people who are willing to stand up and move forward for Brockton. People like Ines. Um, since I've met her, she was a person that people say, you know, that is the go-to person in the Latino community. She is someone that's willing to put people before herself. And I think we need more people like that to stand up and say, this isn't right. It's time for us to advocate for ourselves. Um, another problem, Cape Verdean, I'm a Cape Verdean American. My parents immigrated here in the 89. So the part of being disenfranchised is a part of enrollment that we talked about. Because if a person comes here and does not know any better and has no one to advocate on their behalf, how will they know? With no family, people who come here that are here to work, here to better their, better their families, you know, and move up, um, you know, make the American dream. Um, as another part of the problem is from three to six, as Angel and I have talked about numerous times, school is very important. I agree with that. But from what you do from three o'clock to six o'clock, is very important as well. If you're not involved at school, if you're not in these programs, if you're not playing sports, we all know where that can lead you. And I was one of those chill kids that lead to the, the, the streets, to the gang life. So we need more programs like Champion City uh, Mentoring Program. We need more intramural sports. We need more people that, are, like I said, are just going to stand up and say, I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this for the better of my city, so I'm going to make this program. And we need to help them with open arms. Um, Economic development, I've talked about before. Um, I was in a program at, in college where we created a business within our school. Um, I was one of the advocators for it. We created a brand of ice cream solely for the profits of helping homeless veterans. Since I graduated and brought that, with that plan forward, we've employed two homeless veterans in our college, and we've raised, I think, over ten dollars or $20,000 on the behalf of just helping people. So these are some products that we can bring. Thank you. And let's talk about youth programs first. And I believe that in these tough times with our, our school department's budget down 16, 18 million dollars, we can't rely on our schools solely to keep our children busy in the hours after school between when school gets out and when um, our parents come home from work. So I really believe there has to be a partnership between charitable organizations in the city that work with children like the Old Colony YMCA, like uh, Boys and Girls Club of Brockton. I, I think some of the churches have to get involved in all of this and also possibly BIC. And we all have to work together to develop programs to keep our kids busy five days a week until their parents come home. And, and I, I, you know, I have young adults, but for many years I had children, and that was always my goal, keep them busy. I was forever heading down to the Y so that they could play basketball and blow off some steam and, and get some exercise. Um, I'm very interested in seeing this happen because what our children do in those hours is crucial to their development. Keep them out of mischief. Hi, I'm Ian Borgon. I'm the Ward 5 City Councilor. I'm running for re-election. So I'm supposed to break this down. Yeah. Oh. We're running a meeting, please. Okay. And, uh, okay, I'm sorry. And I'm Ian Borga, the Ward 5 City Councilor. I'm running for re-election and have been asked a couple of questions here. So interesting. I was just, I came here and then I ran across the street to Cafe Towers. They were having a candidates night also. So that was just one of the discussions. Ashley was pre-K and how they want to prepare um, young kids for the future and have various programs within the school system. Now you understand as a city councilor, we vote on the school budget, but we do not decide the curriculum, but we work closely with the school department and the school committee members and they explained how they're changing the dates for children to get into, uh, what is it, kindergarten, so that they'll have more time to be prepared and learn more and have a more extensive, because we have a, a lot of, um, full day kindergarten and a lot of communities in, throughout the state of Massachusetts don't and we're one of them that does here in Broughton. The other question was on youth programs. Well, I, in my other life, I'm with the Broughton Library Foundation and what we do is raise funds for the Broughton Public Library System and um, support programs and one of the programs actually is um, 
all youth involved. So let's see, we have a youth program now with the kids doing poetry and rap. Then we have a program with the art. Then we have programs, reading programs. And then we have tutoring programs. And then we do funding also. And the latest one that's the most exciting, I think, because I'm biased here, is STEM, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we want people to understand that kids are getting huge opportunities helping to learn how to build robots and other technological advances that are not only going to give them opportunities uh, you know, throughout their lives, but also whether jobs or opportunities for college and other programs like that. And the last part we talked about, job preparedness. Well, one of the whole programs out of that is a spinoff is um, they say learning code, which when we were way, way back, and this all started, we used to talk of it as being a computer programmer. But now there's 200,000 jobs starting now that are open for individuals to do this. So with the Broughton Public Library System, because like I said, I I'm, I'm, do the unfun stuff. I run the gift shop. That, that part's fun. But I raise the money in all other ways and write grants, etc., to get funding for various programs like that. We already work with the schools. We work with a lot of the talents in the city of Brockton. People don't realize how many educated professionals we have in the city doing a great deal and contributing. So that, I feel, you know, is a little bit of good coverage there. First of all, thank you very much. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Now, the last question before we open it up to the floor for questions is how do do you plan to work with the police on youth relations? And also, most importantly, everybody in this room is concerned with how are you going to work with the police in monitoring sex offenders? We'll start backwards. Okay. I believe in community policing. You got two minutes, everybody. I believe in true community policing, which means that. Can everybody here? The police are around our neighborhoods. They're talking to our children and to people on the streets. They make us feel welcome, not like, not like they're accusing us of something. I, I believe in that. If our police need an attitude adjustment, we, we need to work on that. Um, I believe most of our police are very good, and I, I, I admire them for taking their lives in their hands to protect all of us in the city of Brockton. But I, I think there has to be more work. In, in, when I first moved to Brockton 27 years ago, there were policemen running basketball teams and baseball teams, soccer, and getting involved in children's recreational activities. I would love to see that happen again. I really would. And as for monitoring sex offenders, well, I know quite a bit about this because there actually were sex offenders in my neighborhood in Ward 4 just a few years ago. And I think we have to do a better job of letting um, neighbors know when there are level three sex offenders living close yes. to them um, or close to a school. Now the level two and the level one, it, it's a different issue by state law, but I think we have to make people aware that they can go down to the police department to find out about the level twos. And also I think there's a registry for level ones that you can check online. Um, we need to be aware of that and it's not something you think about when you move into a neighborhood are there any sex offenders around me? And yet, in Brockton, we have quite a few sex offenders living here. I'm sure part of it is because they work in our community, um, or we have inexpensive living situations, but it, we can't be more aware of this to keep our children safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, if I could just say, um, Judy uh, Sullivan is here. She's the Ward 5 school committee person. She's trying to make her way in here. and. Um, Again, she was across the street like myself. So, okay, you wanted to know about um, sex offenders. It's, it's interesting because I have a good, yes, I have a, a very close and dear friend who actually works um, as a, an attorney to try to keep sex offenders in prison and, uh, how would I say it, works with the, you know, individuals to, not the, the sex offenders themselves, but those that have been victims and uh, fa their family members to work closely to maintain, uh, how would I say it, uh, the proper punishment in, in, in these instances. But myself, I believe that the, the more that we inform individuals, I know that they provide flyers uh, and lists to the schools, and I think that's huge because a lot of the concern is with young people. 
I also realize that sex offenders come in a lot of varieties and one would never expect certain situations. So again, diligence with our police force, diligence with law enforcement as at all levels because we have the district attorney's office here in the city of Broughton informing us so we can inform individuals at, that the residents here that they need to know this and how they can protect themselves. I believe that that seems to be a little bit missing and a little disconnect so that should be reinforced and something we'll start working on. And the other part you had talked about was with um, police and youth. And it's interesting because we were just talking also about how we want more young police officers. We think the younger they are, the more they can relate to young people, the more technologically savvy they are, the more they can communicate with them. I'm a strong, yep, I'm a strong proponent of community policing. Um, downtown, we have community policing in some areas, not enough. So that is one of the, how would I say, projects we've been working with as um, a group and through the Downtown Broughton Association other pro programs. So thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Um, like others have said, community policing is key um, because a lot of times there's a disconnect between police officers and converting people where we get people who are not from Brockton. So we need to bridge that gap to start because a lot of times values, morals, and things that help people think may be different from the way American politics and policing runs. Um, I'm a big promoter of Neighborhood Watch. I've actually been talking to some of my neighbors um, to try to reintegrate the community in Neighborhood Watch and have people be accountable for their communities. You know, if you see something, you have to do your civic duty and you need to call the police. But I am a big promoter that you need to call the police and feel comfortable that nothing will happen to you. So in other, we also need to promote programs like Police in the Streets, sponsored by Rosie Brown. Um, I was a ref there, and it was maybe one of the greatest experiences I've had to see police and young people playing basketball together and, you know, looking away from mainstream media of how... Uh, the media prom promotes some of us to look. Um, so that was a great experience. With sex offenders, I feel like we need to have open line of communication. We, people need to know where they live and who lives next to them. You need to know your neighbors as they're yourself. Um, in the real estate process, I feel like this could be something that we could add in. If you're buying a house, I think you should know who lives next to you. You should know if you have a uh, sex offender in your neighborhood. Um, but also, I'm a counselor, so I might have a different view than others, but I think that sex offenders are people that we need to, we need to reintegrate into society. These are people that will not most likely be in prison their entire life, so we need to bring them back into the community and reintegrate them and rehabilitate them as well. Thank That's you. from a counselor's perspective. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it real. That's that the, regarding, I want to tackle the, the issue of the sex offenders first. Um, that is that is an issue personally. You know, we're all you know. For those of you who are who are parents, it's 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 a very sensitive, uh, understandable um, concern. Um, I think there's registries for that kind of stuff that you could utilize, right? You can go to the police station, and there's a list of individuals there. Um, but also, uh, kind of what what Derek was saying, I, I agree that individuals um, shouldn't be demonized for the rest of their life. And and the reason I'm saying that, and I have no shame to say this. It comes from compassion, from spirituality, from what would Jesus do if he was here, right? Would he, would he excommunicate these individuals? And I'm not excusing them. It is, it is a horrible, horrible, horrible act. Yet at the same time, we could, we could offer them some counseling and, and at the same time protect your children. I think we could do both. Um, regarding the police issue, I think, um, you know, I, I used to work for Brockton Interfaith Community. And one of the first things that we did when I was with BIC is we surveyed the youth on police relations, and we probably got about 100 surveys from the young people. And it's no surprise that the young people in Brockton felt that they were targeted, not simply because of race, but because of how they dress, how they act, because of the fact that they're young. Um, and we went to the city council, right? And we presented this information, and some of the city council members were, were asking me questions like, did you verify that information? Did you go to the police department? Did that really happen? Instead of saying, yes, it's true, how can we help? Right? So um, we need community policing. We need prevention versus proactive approaches. We need more police that are diverse, that reflect the community. Um, we need juvenile expungement for those individuals who are caught up in the system and need second opportunities. Um, Newbie is making a film called Protect, Serve, and Care, 
which talks about the <coughs> relations between the police. So look out for that movie. You're going to learn a lot about it. Mass incarceration, police bias is real. Discretion within the criminal justice system is real, and we need to fix those things in order to reduce mass incarceration and the disproportionate black and brown people that are caught up in the system. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, again. Um, I'll start off with uh, community policing. So we have school resource officers in our school system. We currently have a budget crisis, as many people know, in the schools. We need to bring back as many. If we, if we need more school resource officers, we need more engagement with our police on a daily basis in our schools. It starts when they're young. I attended a program called Not My Kid at the George School the other night about two weeks ago. It was open for elementary school students, their, their parents, to attend and learn about drug awareness. And they're starting younger and younger. Nine people, nine people were at that event, including myself and the PTA. We need parents to get involved. We need the schools to promote these things more. We need our school resource officers to be engaged with our students. We need to work with the city council to make sure that we have more police officers engaging our kids. In Boston, they have a, 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 an ice cream truck that rolls around during the summer and, and interacts with their kids. We need things like that to be interacted with our kids. Now, as far as sex offenders go, I'm going to put on my, 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 unfortunately, dad hat a little bit. and I, I, I respectfully disagree with, with my colleagues up, up here on, on this issue. I have no tolerance for level two and level three sex offenders. Zero tolerance. My job is to protect your children in and out of school every single day. And I don't care. I, I, I understand that they've made mistakes in their life and they need compassion, but my job is to make sure I protect your kids. I want to see us work with the state legislator to make sure that level two is on the registry as well. Because level two is just a step from level three. That's just somebody who hasn't been caught again, as far as I'm concerned. We need to make sure we put those on the registry so you know, as parents, where your children are walking and who in your neighborhood is a level two or level three sex offender. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to give uh, Mrs. Sullivan uh, an opportunity to answer the same questions. We're asking what uh, you would do to work with the police to monitor sex offenders, and also how would you work with the police to increase uh, their relationship with our youth from both sides? Okay. Um, and please introduce yourself to us. My name is Judy Sullivan, and I am your present Ward 5 Can school. Can you speak up a little bit? Again? I am your present Ward 5 school committee person, and I am running for my third term in Ward 5 for your schools. And um, the schools are always working with the police on issues involving sex offenders. We, there is a site that tells you who the sex offenders are and where they live, and the schools release that information. Um, and the second question was? Community uh, policing. Yeah. Our police, police department <laughs> with youth. Um, okay. The police department presently, I think they're still running the great program, which they come into the school, gang resistance and violence. Okay, they have run the DEA program in the past, but of course there's no money for that right now, which is um, a, a drug program, the DEA program. Um, the city councilors, the ward um, councilors, your school committee, and the police, and the mayor all work together for your betterment and for the safety of this community and their schools. Thank you very much. Now, um, antes de, de primero, Vamos a darle una gracia porque lo vamos a abrir para el piso para cualquier pregunta que ustedes tengan. Uh, first of all, we want to thank all of you for attending and once again giving the community the respect that it deserves. When we will not forget that when election day comes, who was here with us and who wasn't here with us. But the most important is I would like to do no I would like to thank Ines for putting this together. You can go. Yeah. And she definitely deserves it. She definitely deserves it. This is.
the first time for her, but it won't be the last time for, for our community. As you will know, we are very interested in the issues. We do come out. People say Latinos don't come out to meetings. Yes, we do come out to meetings. And for the candidates, please never forget to put your information in two languages. Because a lot of times I don't see that happening. Please, if you want our participation, some of us speak the language, some don't, but we all vote. Amen. Ma'am, yeah. ma now I, I'd like to turn it over to, to Dan. Uh, Dan will run the question and answer. And once again, thank you for asking me to be your moderator. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to turn it open to the uh, floor now for general questions. Please speak up with, because unfortunately this mic is not portable and it does not stretch all the way out to the very end. So please speak up when you ask your questions. Is there any questions of that? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. You have one here. And this is for uh, each of the candidates. You have. You can either respond or not, but you only have maybe 90 seconds to respond to this, okay? Very quickly. Yes, ma'am. Well, my name is Francis Gibbs, and I am a long time um, Brockton Interfaith, uh, working for the community, which is big. This is going to take more than 90 seconds, I think. Um, my first question is, I, did, we, I got a little background on everybody. I know most of you at the table. But my question is, why is the immigrant issue so deep in your heart? And what do you know about immigrants? And I'm going to come back with a three-part question. Um, can I let them go with that or no, 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 no. do it all? No, okay. no, no, don't do it all. Let, okay. let them right. answer that one. Okay. Give somebody else a chance. All right. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, for example, my parents are immigrants. My first language is not English. Je parle français, c'est plus facile, c'est All right, meanwhile, um, yes, the immigrant issue, it's interesting because I was with Broughton Interfaith Community and a lot of other great people that were involved with the whole issue of addressing us and making us uh, having the Trust Act. And I supported that and I continue to support any way that we can keep individuals safe in the community and not because I feel, yes, that there is oftentimes, unfortunately, a bias with individuals who others feel if they don't have a command of the English language are not is necessarily treated properly. And one of the biggest parts of this trust act that we were supporting was the fact that we wanted individuals to be able to call the police and be able to have their concerns addressed and not be questioned or otherwise uh, viewed in some other uh, fashion and uh, be, feel threatened. So yes, uh, immigrant issues are strong and dear. And at the federal level, well, let's hope that we can keep those individuals that have come to our uh, country when they were young um, and be part of our education system. Thank so thank you. Yeah. Anyone else like to respond? I will. Um, so, so first of all, who in here is not an immigrant in some way, right? So first of all, we're all human beings. Um, I, like Councillor uh, Beauregard, I worked with, with Vic on the Trust Act, um, and I, I pushed that forward in the council. Arguably, um, some of the councillors were not in favor. And the reason for that, guys, plain and simple, let's keep it real, we're a growing immigrant community here in Brockton. Right? And there's a lot of fear mongering. A lot of the previous question had to do with fear. The boogeyman is coming to get you. How real is that? Right? Um, immigrants are hardworking individuals who are family oriented. It's a small percentage. In fact, there was an arrest in Brockton. So let's talk about facts. Uh, in Massachusetts, people arrested um, who were immigrants. 50 people were arrested in Massachusetts. Of those, uh, I believe only only uh, 30 of them did not have criminal records, right? So all this rhetoric about criminals, those are the ones that were, that's not true, right? And it even affected one individual here in our city. Um, so I'm, I'm a proponent of, of, of the Trust Act. I also support DACA. I wrote an article in The Globe recently defending DACA. My opponent was not my opponent in the race, but my opponent who was writing about it was all in favor of the scary immigrant who's coming to get you. Right, um, so it's fear mongering. It's it's fear of the other in Brockton. We have a growing, we have a big Latino community, Cape Verdean, Haitian American, 
um, and, and we need to embrace our brothers and sisters. Um, we have power in diversity, right? And if we work together, we can accomplish so much more. So that's why it's near and dear to my heart. My parents are from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico suffering. Uh, Brockton is not doing enough for that. I know the community is. I'm talking about the city elected officials. It's time for us to work together. We're all immigrants. Amen. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd, I'd be happy to answer that too. So just to let you know, um, on the school committee, um, they recently passed a resolution. Um, I'm sure Ms. Sullivan can, can attest to this, um, that basically says that uh, we're not going to be, you know, working with ICE and various agencies. If I'm elected, I can guarantee you there is no way that I will not put up a stake. There is no way that federal agencies will be going into our schools to take kids out of our schools to deport them or to deport their parents or to look for information about deporting their parents. It's unconscionable that any federal agency would even think to do that, first of all. Secondly, I do support DACA. I support these, these, these methods to make sure that we have a, a vibrant a, con a, a vibrant um, community within all of our community. I have a saying, I say, our, few, uh, our children, our future, one Brockton. That means I don't care if you're Puerto Rican, I don't care if you're black, I don't care what race, color, creed you are. Every kid deserves a quality education in this city, and if I'm elected, I'm going to make sure that that's one of my priorities. My grandparents immigrated to America at the turn of the 20th century. Um, they came from Ireland. They had nothing. They had nothing. When they got here, they were, they were discriminated against. These stories have come down through my family. And, and I feel like I'm, I walk them, I live them, because what your family experiences, you experience. Um, I, I, I feel for immigrants. We are, we are all immigrants, as someone has said. And I don't understand what the big deal was with the Trust Act. It's just keeping people safe. Um, and, of course, most of you must know that in June, the, the Massachusetts Judici Supreme Judicial Court handed down the Lund case, which said that our, our, um, we're not supposed to work with ICE. That's not what our, our police are supposed to do or our government agencies. ICE can do their job, but we, we're not supposed to cooperate at all or help them out. And I totally believe that, and I, I just, I, I think this issue is so crucial to Brockton, but also to all of the United States. Thank you. Um, like many others have said, I am a first generation Cape Verde American. My parents came here in 1989. Um, I feel like a lot of our, how we look at immigrants is from the political atmosphere that we're in. Um, not calling out any names, but immigrants have kind of got the scope on, you know, in the past, you know, year or two. Um, the media has played a big part as well. Immigrants do not, are not the prime source for crime in the United States. We account, immigrants account for less than 1% of total crime in the United States. But if you look at the media and you never looked up in a book or went to college, you would think it was 50% at this point. Um, we need... We are a growing community. Immigrants are the ones that drive us. My parent, my mom came here in 1989, has been working the same job, making I think $15 an hour. My first job, I made more than my mom. She put money, she put food on the table, bought a house, put me through college, put me through high school, and now we're here. Thank you. I think many of you know who I am. I'm Bishop Tony Branch, and I've asked Inez to give me just a moment. I need you all to look at each other's neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say these words. I am here. I am here. I'm not hearing you. I am here. I am here. Because I need you. Because I need you. Amen. Amen. I think the, the biggest issue that we've experienced is that people that don't look like us, am I talking right? are in positions of power, and they don't understand us. Amen. Amen? Amen. I'm chairman of the Diversity Commission for the City of Brockton, as many of you all know. I made findings, or at least the commission made findings several months ago with respect to diversity in Brockton Public Schools. We're currently now moving on to the municipal government, which is Brockton City Hall. Not many politicians in the City of Brockton 
participated in this process. In fact, a new ordinance was issued regarding hiring practices. No one had a conversation with the Diversity Commission. So my question is this, with respect to diversity of the police department, where there is only one temporary sergeant of color, she's brown, uh, Brenda Perez, uh, I believe she's Spanish speaking, she's our, our only temporary sergeant. With respect to the school department, the, uh, there are no school committee members that are people of color. What about diversity in employment and respect for the city and, and with respect to City Hall? And what I basically is asking directly, this is a direct question, what are you going to do about diversity in the city of Brockton? Are you willing to, for those that are running for the school committee, are you willing to attack the issue of the teacher's contract where when black and brown are hired, we are the first fired? Are y'all listening to me? This is really happening. With respect to City Hall, if the mayor goes, a majority of those that are people of color that are managers can go as well. What are we willing to do about diversity? Concrete information for the black and the brown that are in this room. Amen. So I'm probably the only person here that was directly affected uh, by, the, by the recent layoffs of, of the teachers, right? So I was laid off as, a, as an educator um, due to the budget crisis, and then I was recalled back, gratefully, right? But 80 of my colleagues or so are not back. So that pains me as a, as a, as a, as a fellow um, educator. Um, what am I going to do about it? I'm running for office, folks, right? If you want to change the status quo, you got to run for, you got to run, you got to take part in the, in, the, in the process. And so that's what I'm personally doing. I was on that committee of teacher diversity in Brockton. I'm an educator because in college, there was a professor who was Puerto Rican who I said, man, she looks like me. She grew up in Chicago. She's from the hood. And she's a, a professor with a, with a doctor before her name. I could do that too, right? So because somebody looked like me, and, and was from the same community, it inspired me. And that's what I'm trying to do to my students. So I'm an educator and I'm trying to instill that. So those are all the things that I'm doing. In terms of the police department, diversity in City Hall, diversity um, uh, within, within the police department, I think, I think it actually needs to reflect the community. If there's 40% uh, black, uh, if there's 10% if there's Latino, then the police department, the school uh, system, and City Hall needs to reflect that. And so we, there's 40% candidates, by the way, who are running right now who are of color. And so I think we're stepping up to do that. So I'll tell you what I have done and what I'm going to do. So I'm up here as a former school committee member. I, I lost my last re-election by 31 votes. I'm asking you to put me back in the school system to right the, the ship. So as far as diversity goes, I'm on the executive board with the NAACP. I've been a member of the NAACP for the past few years. I've been adamant, absolutely adamant, that we hold our schools and our, our, our superintendent accountable for creating a more diverse workforce. If I'm elected to the school committee, I will go back and we will look at that contract and see if we can rectify that issue of first in, last out. That's the first thing I will do. I'm the only school committee candidate, my opponent has this, hasn't done this, I'm the only one who put his money where his mouth is. We don't have enough teachers of color. So what I did was I started a scholarship with my money to ask for a young man or woman of color to come forward and enter the field of teaching and I would give them money towards their education. Because I believe that it's easy enough to talk here about diversity. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm saying we need as a community also to act. We need to offer incentives to our Latino community, to our African American community, all our, our, our communities to get into the field of teaching. Because it's absolutely critical that we have teachers of color. Uh, my name is Doree Smith. I'm running for Ward 5 City Council. And I have been volunteering and active in political action for a number of years. And in particular, um, in the 70s, Boston had a court case. And we may have to go to court to break that contract in order to get um, seniority versus affirmative action um, back installed. And we, we need to be ready for it. And we need to be ready to go to court. We need to be ready to have uh, groups community groups support parents who want their children to be taught by te teachers of color, black, brown, whatever, and, and 
get a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer, <laughs> and fight this and show up in court and show up in large numbers and be ready for the fight and be ready as a community. Don't just let one or five parents be out there alone. It is your community, it is your children, it is your future. Children progress better when they're so far behind that they need people who look like them to talk to, to them, like them, to push them to do their personal best and go beyond their personal best. If it means going into court, you've got to be ready for the fight. They did it in Boston. I was chair of the Black Caucus of the Boston Teachers Union. You've got to be prepared to do it again. <coughs> She just, she just mentioned the, uh, the court case. My name is Nancy DiMacito. I'm running for school committee, Ward 5. Um, I, I just wanted to say that, yes, she's 100% right. Because right now, your, your children are all being taught. This is a diverse city. We're a, a minority majority in the city of Brockton. But they're not represented in the school system. In this school system, they're not represented. The kids are in classrooms with 30 plus kids. What are they learning in there? They have kids in there that are in study two or three periods a day. What are they doing in there? We're taking away, we're giving our kids a disadvantage from the beginning. And then when they end up going to jail or going to court later, well, what do we do? We gave them that pathway to go there. We need to start thinking about this now because it's only gonna get worse from here. Hello everyone. Hola mi gente. My name is Jimmy Pereira, mayoral candidate for the city of Brockton. And uh, first I want to thank you for this opportunity. And something that was mentioned, uh, actually a few times mentioned, is about cultural competency. Uh, it's, about, it's not about just about uh, making sure that we have representation, but it's about educating everyone that's at the table. No matter what color you are, no matter where you come from, we need to learn about each other, and that's important. And you mentioned the school to prison pipeline, Nancy. I actually am a product of the city of Brockton. I actually went to the school system, and I didn't get to go to Brockton High. I actually went to B.B. Russell, Phoenix, the alternative school. Uh, not where, where my mother wanted me to be, but that's where I ended up. And because of my actions in school and because of the lack of guidance in school as well, I didn't have teachers that knew where I come from. They didn't know about the struggles that my mom went through. They didn't speak the language that my people, that my family spoke as well. And I want to make sure that we have advocacy on our, on our school committee and make sure that we have that in our government as well. We need to make sure that we speak out. We need to make sure that those that are working for us speak out as well. And that they don't forget, once they get into that position, who they work for. Uh, again, going through the school to prison pipeline, I went to the Department of Youth Services, DYS, where they uh, basically detain uh, young adolescent at-risk youth. And through that experience, I was able to see uh, what happens in these detention facilities as well, the lack of guidance there as well. And I had the opportunity later on to go back and work for the Department of Youth Services and make sure that we incorporated cultural competency to those that are going through the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so what we did, basically, we walked through the, the buildings, the detention facilities, and we seen that there wasn't really any black or brown faces. We've seen paintings of people that didn't come from the community and didn't come from the struggle as well. Uh, so we changed that. We made sure that we taught everybody that was there, no matter where they came from, about cultural company. So if they did come from, whether it be Bridgewater or if they came from uh, Easton, they know about the community that they worked with. That's very important as well. And uh, again, running for mayor is about making sure that we work with the school community, especially at head, head of committee as well, too. And that's what we want as well, too. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> I just wanted to say for the, uh, the Brockton, um, the city of Brockton has a diversity task force. The Brockton Public Schools also has a diversity task force, okay, that would, they will be coming out into the community this year to get your input on issues that need to be resolved, okay. Uh, the ones, the people that have their kids go to the West Middle School, there was just a principal hired of color there. Okay? There was just three associate principals hired, and two of them are people of color. That just happened this year. That's good. Any other responses to that question? That just happened, correct? 
that yeah. just happened, just, the yeah. diversity that you're saying that they're trying to include yeah, in the school and all that. Community. So that just happened, but After we have a 68%, right. Right. we have 68% minority majority in this city. So what happened all this time? What happened all this time, though? But you just said you're just doing it now. I'll be the first. Well, we're going out for yes, into parents. Any other questions from the floor? Oh well, right here. Oh, we have that one over here. No, no, thank you. Um, I really liked you guys to go through the trust act and the relationship between uh, students families, and the police. How will you guys will be implementing it? Trust Act, Sanctuary City. Thank you. Hello again. So, uh, as some of you may or may not know, I'm actually a first generation immigrant. <clears throat> My mom came from Cape Verde Island, Islands. And I actually, uh, growing up in Springfield as well, I uh, was in the foster care system and I actually lived with a, uh, a, a lot of different families, but one of the families was actually uh, Puerto Rican. They came from uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Bayamon, and uh, in other communities as well. I lived with a, a Jamaican family as well, and I lived with a, uh, a, a African American family. I lived with a Greek family as well. Uh, but through my own experiences and learning about cultural and diversity as well, and being a, uh, and I'll, I'll share my own stories as well. So going into school and getting into trouble, right? They call my mom and they say, Marie, you got to come get your son. He's in, he's in trouble, and my mom would worry because she doesn't know that she wasn't she didn't know that you know when you're going through the the, the process of receiving your immigration, uh, you can't get in trouble. You can't go to the court system. You can't be appear in court, and it, it's scary for a lot of our immigrant communities. What I want to do is work with our immigration community. It's very important that we both educate the immigration that the immigration community that's here, but those that are here as well, that have already got their green card, that are already American citizens, that are comfortable where they are. Because once you're comfortable, you don't think about the person that's going through the struggle. It's very important that we have a mayor or have leaders in our community that have this experience that could talk about it with our community. Because the years that went by when my mom had to worry about her taking, having her green card taken away, or her not receiving American citizenship was the biggest burden on her shoulders. And it translated off to me as well, too, because I had to make sure that I was on the right path. And when I didn't get on the right path, I had to look at my mom and say, sorry, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I want to fight for our community because I don't want our children to have to say sorry to their parents when their parents are in trouble as well. Again, make sure that you vote for someone that has the experience, the personal experience, the academic experience, and the professional experience as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'll speak on that. I'll speak on that one. Excellent. Um, Please introduce yourself. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm so sorry, folks, for being late. I think you know there was a lot of events going on. Uh, there was an event that was supposed to be on the 19th. They pushed it on the 24th. I think some of us came late, so I was there. But uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Gene Bradley, the winning court, winning for Brockton City Council at large. It is an honor and a privilege for me to be here this evening. <clears throat> of course, I would like to thank my good friend Ines for putting this together and of course her daughter. So, immigration, I think that's a very interesting subject. Well, I think by my, me speaking, you can see that I speak with an accent. It means that I come from so health. I was born in Haiti. I came in this country um, seven years ago, or about that, six years and nine months. Uh, when I first came, um, I was a legal permanent resident. I was not a U.S. citizen. So for me, to talk about immigration, I think it's something that I that I know because I've been there and done it. It's not just something that someone is telling me. Unfortunately, my family brought me in this country legally, but I know some of my fellow classmates whom I went to school with, um, they are on a situation called TPS, which is Temporary Protected Status. I mean, I know immigration is a federal issue, but I think we gotta be able to empathize and not just sitting here looking great <clears throat> and blah, 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 but I think we have to understand the substance of it. So what I did, I became a U.S. citizen. I took the exam, studied hard, passed it, and now I carry a U.S. passport. I believe some of you have been through that process too, and I believe most of us would like to know it. I think immigration is something that defines me. I think it's immigration is something that we know. It's one thing to talk about a subject just for the sake of talking about it, but it's another thing to be able to bring it and facing it. And as we speak, one of my um, former college classmates, he's one of the most smartest kids that I know. Um, he is under that TPS. And as you know, we have about 50,000 Haitian people in this country who came after the earthquake 
receiving that. And as we speak, we don't know whether or not the Trump administration will give them that authorization to continue to stay here. So I know what it means. I can empathize with your situation. Locally speaking, I can tell you that there are few things that we can do, but I think we can advocate some of those at the state levels, at the federal levels, to talk to them openly and loudly with decency and let them know that, well, if you want our vote, this is what you're going to do. I mean, I know some of us can, oh, I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, so I, I thought I thought you said I finished. So immigration is something that I'm very passionate about, and um, I think among all of us, I am the only person who was born somewhere else who became a U.S. citizen. So I'm warning for city council at large because I don't know if if one of you were born somewhere and became I don't know, but I think I can speak for myself. I was born in Haiti, became a U.S. citizen, so I went through that process. So I will do my best to advocate for all of you. And I will do my best to advocate, not just advocate, but advocate accordingly and effectively, because I know the issues. So thank you so much for this opportunity. And God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gary Keith Sr. and I'm running for city council at large. Um, I support the Trust Act. As a 23-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, I feel that we need immigration reform, and I think we need it now, and I think that everyone should advocate for it, and I would be the biggest advocate, advocate for that. As far as the Trust Act goes, I believe that the federal police should be able to do, they let them do their job while the local police do theirs. The local police should have no right stopping anyone, asking them what their immigration status is, or anything like that, and breaking up families that have been here all their lives. I've, I know a lot of families that have been here, they own businesses, they own their homes, and they've been here forever, and I know families right now that have been torn apart, okay? And it's not right. And this city was built, this country was built on immigration. There's not anyone in this country right now, my family, believe it or not, are, are American Indians, okay? Those are the only natural Americans in this country. And this, uh, this country was built on immigration. I think we need to, immigration reform, we need it right now. And I will be a, a, a firm advocate for immigration reform. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Jane Bradley, the winning court. I'm running for Brockton City Council at large. It's an honor for me to be here, and I hope I can count on your vote on November 7th. Let me tell you why. What I just said. Uh, six years and nine months ago, I came in this country. I could not speak a word of English. But I did. Uh, I dedicated myself to learn the language, went to college, graduated, and get a job for myself. And so far, I've been working on a lot of issues. And one of the issues that I'm so proud of was in 2014, when we passed question four, earn sick time for all Massachusetts workers. Some of you are familiar with Raise Up Massachusetts and CSJ and 1199. So far, I've been endorsed by 1199 SEIU, 1199-509, And I think it's a message to send out there to see that, well, those organizations not just endorse me, but they understand decency, credibility, and honesty. So I hope when you go to that poll on November 7th, you will give me one of your four votes. It's four seats. I'm not wanting for any empty seat. I'm wanting for one of those seats. I hope you will cast your ballot for me. And by casting that ballot, you vote for decency, respect, youth empowerment, education, public safety, homelessness, seniors, and immigration, of course. So, November 7th, please vote for Gene Bradley, the winning court. If you forget my name, it will be the longest name on the ballot. So you can have one with that one. And the fourth name. May God bless you all, and I love you all, and I hope you guys enjoy the evening. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gary Keith, Sr. And I'm running for the third time for Council at Lodge for the great city of Brockton. I'm a husband of 31 years, this beautiful lady right here, a father to seven, a grandfather to four. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I'm a 23-year background in law enforcement out of the city of Boston. I currently serve you on our planning board and our zoning board here in our government right that we have here now. Um, with that, I'm the most experienced candidate running outside of our incumbents, the three incumbents, I'm the most experienced candidate running for this position of Councilor at Lodge. With my lifelong experience of being 58 years old, I've been, ser I've been serving um, for 41 years. I'm a 27-year member of my church, which is Jubilee. I put God first in everything I do, and I pray over the city of Brockton each and every single day because I believe that if we don't put God first, 
we'll never be able to get this city back for one thing. Okay? And the main thing that you have to do is this. We need experienced leadership to get everything that you want done and to have people vote for, for me. We need experienced leadership, and you don't have to look any further than at, at our federal government down in Washington, D.C., to see what voting in inexperienced leaders does to our country. And if we vote in inexperienced leadership right now, we're going to do the same thing to the city of Brockton, and we have a hard time right now. That's not an endorsement when I talk about experience. That's not an endorsement to the incumbents because they need to get off of their butts and earn their seats every single day, every single election also. So my name is Gary Keefe Sr. I'm the seventh name on the ballot. The seventh number is God's completion, and I'm asking you for your vote. Thank you very much. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Jimmy Pereira, mayor candidate for the city of Brockton. Madam, thank you for that honest, deep question. Uh, what I will be doing for the city is, again, bringing my personal experience, academic experience, professional experience. I work at the Old County Planning Council, your regional planning agency. I work, I've worked with different institutions like the Department of Youth Services, like Commonwealth Corporation as well. What I'll be doing is bringing innovation, inclusion, and transparency to our city. That's what's needed. That's what we deserve. Uh, working with the at-risk youth, that's something that I hold dear to my heart. I've been a motivational speaker for the Department of Youth Services. I am basically a poster child for the Department of Youth Services. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am one of the only uh, alumni, DYS <coughs> alumni, that went to a four-year college that is actually running for mayor as well. Uh, and if I can do it, our youth can do it as well. I know about the bullet holes that you're talking about. Uh, I've seen it. I've actually been a part of it growing up in the city of Brockton. We want to change that. We want to provide a youth. We want to provide the role model for our community. We want to make sure that we engage our youth and we engage people on all different levels as well. Uh, the professional background that I have instilled that in me. The personal experience that I had instilled that in me as well. I always pray to God. I make sure I go to church as well, St. Edenstein. And that's what I make sure I do. Work with morals. Thank you. Hello, I am Judy Sullivan, your present Ward 5 school committee person, and I am running for my third term. And I would like um, everyone to make no mistake about it. The Brockton Public Schools is for diversity. We have our diversity, diversity task force. Positions are open to everyone. The, School, the superintendent and her administration team and the school committee is for all students and all parents. Um, right now there's a budget crisis okay, in the school system, which we have had to take many cuts. So we need to have someone in there who understands the budget. We have our Chapter 70 money, which comes from the state. We have our, well, that's our net school spending. Okay, that's the money we get from the state. Okay, we're given money, a certain percentage, every year. The, Non-net is your busing, your crossing guards, your school police, things like that. That goes to the city. Then the city has to turn a certain percentage over to us. So it's very important to understand the budget and what goes into it. And I have four years in understanding that. Okay, it took me, you know, that long to understand it. And I am a voice for all children and parents. Anyone could call me, send me an email anytime, and I'll get your issues resolved. My name is Susan DeCastro. I've lived in Ward 4 for 27 years, and I'm running to represent Ward 4 on the Brockton City Council. Um, I, I believe I have the experience, the integrity, and the character to do this job well. As I said, I've lived here 27 years, and I've been following all of the issues that happen in Ward 4. I'm also trained as an attorney. I spent five years on the Brockton Planning Board, two years on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm a volunteer with the Charity Guild and the Brockton Library Foundation and others. You know, Ward 4 is very diverse. And I want to represent everyone in Ward 4. And I think the biggest, the most significant issue that happened in Ward 4, the challenge, started 10 years ago when a developer decided that Ward 4 would be a great place to put a power plant, a, a fossil fuel burning power plant. And, you know, in the research that I did before I decided to oppose this, what I found out is that they like to bring these power plants to areas where people don't have the money or the time to oppose these power plants. And that's why they go to communities that are diverse <coughs> and that, that have limited funds. I've been fighting this power plan for 10 years. I was, I was 
sued for $65 million, along with other city officials. I want to represent all of Ward 4, just as I worked against, against the power plant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm Ian Borgat. I'm your Ward 5 City Councilor, 774-297-4939. And I'm running for re-election. Okay, why should you vote for me? I'm, I'm concerned about what this woman brought up. I've been involved with Broughton Interfaith Community. That's why I know some rowdies like Inez. I've been involved with the Coalition for Social Justice uh, up at the State House with uh, Gene Lawton on various issues. I was opposed to the power plant at the very beginning. If it's controversial, somehow I seem to be involved because it's all about empowering people, which I do. I, I'm a strong proponent of transparency, so I encourage everyone to get involved. I also encourage all of you to be aware that there are many positions in commissions. Submit your letter of interest, submit your resume, because the only way you're going to be run this city is by being involved in it. I've had the honor and pleasure of being involved in all these things. Currently, I worship at Messiah Baptist. I came to Broughton in 1962, and... Um, I've been in and out of Broughton since then, so that's a while. But why should um, you run, vote for me again? It's because I'm on accounts committee watching where our money is spent. Because I'm working with the superintendent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think this is a great event. First and foremost, I'll say no matter the decision on November 7th, I will be committed to Broughton and putting people from Brockton first, no matter the decision. We will. <laughs> Why you should vote for me? I'm young, I'm enthusiastic, I'm for the people of Brockton. I have, ex many will say, life experience, experience doesn't matter. I've lived in this city, struggled in this city, and I'm for this city at the end of the day, no matter what. <laughs> and at the end of the day, no matter what, Brockton will be first for me, no matter what, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Sure it is. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. As a matter of fact, you came under. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my name is Angel Manuel Cosme Jr. I'm running for Ward 2 City Councilor. The reason why you should vote for me is honestly, if you take everyone's experiences here, you bundle them up, I have a little bit of everything. I've been endorsed by everyone that Gene has been endorsed. I, Mr. Car uh, Keith, with all due respect, I, I also have experience, not necessarily political experience, that's not a bad thing. You take a community organizer, you take an educator, you take a clinician, you take a substance abuse counselor, you take someone with compassion, you take someone with spirituality, you bundle them all up, and you take someone who has not for one second today had a break, and I'm proud of that. When everyone else got food, which you got to do it, I stayed here and I spoke to the constituents. I'm the person. In all reality, I love people. I love Brockton. I'm tireless in my efforts. Look me up. In the last... Uh, six years, if you follow my Facebook page, you'll see things that I've done in the community. I will be the first Latino elected in Brockton's history, which Woo! is something that we will be proud of. And lastly, lastly, Ward 2 is the most diverse ward in Brockton in terms of diversity. It's time for change. I'm your vote. Well, thank you. Thank you, Inez, for having this forum tonight. Um, my name is Ray Hennings, and I'm running for Ward 7 School Committee. So if you voted North Raymond Sullivan Towers or Bel Air Towers, that's where you go to vote for me. Yes. Cast your vote on November 7th. The reason you should vote for me is that little girl right there. Because I love that little girl. I love all of our children. It doesn't matter where we come from. I'm here to work for you. I'm here to work for your children. I'm a member of the Haitian Community Partners, the Conservation Commission. I'm on the NAACP. I serve on the executive board. I spend my whole time away from my family because I believe in what we do. Where is my opponent? You won't find him here. You don't find him anywhere. Do you know why? Because he shines a seat. 
That's what I don't do. I don't shine a seat. I will work every single day for you. And if I don't get elected, I'll still be around working for you. And I'm the only school committee candidate, the only school committee candidate that is endorsed by the Latin Women's Association because they believe I'm the best candidate for all of our community. My name is Nancy DiMacito. I'm running for Ward 5 School Committee. I feel neglected. I don't have a name tag. Um, I'm the only one up here I think that doesn't have one. But um, I'm running for the School Committee because I feel that we can do better. We have to do better for the kids in Brockton. Have to, like this lady said over here. We have to do better for these kids. Whether it's an IEP that the child needs, whether it's after school extracurricular activities that the child needs. We have to do better for the kids in Brockton. We gotta bring diversity into the school system, whether it be on the school committee, whether it be as teachers teaching our children. We need to keep these kids busy after school. It's not just, okay, you're out, go home, bye. We can't do that anymore. The kids end up on the street. I coach basketball in this city. I coach baseball in this city. I know a lot of people here may know me, may not know me, but I do coach. Um, I have two boys in this city, but no, I don't just have my two boys. I have a lot of boys in this city. They may not know me personally, but they know my son and they all talk to me. I go up to school, when I get my boys at school, hi, Miss Nancy, hi, Mrs. Fernandez. That's my other name. Thank you, guys. Go for me. Um, thank you. Good evening, um, Inez and the Latino Women's Association, and thank you so much. At any time a politician or you give someone a microphone, they should be honored. So I'm going to make this brief. Um, one thing that I do, um, whenever I do, whenever I show up, I roll up my sleeves and I get in and do the hard work. And I want people to walk in and help support me do that. I want you to show up on election day. I don't want any more of the city of Brockton dismissing this community. That's, all, that's over with. That's over with and done with. Because you're showing up here tonight. Show up. Start with um, participating in these people's campaigns because the change is in the ear and they can see it. So please don't stop here. It's only the beginning. And I'm telling you, it's only the beginning. And let's keep it moving every day and show up for the kids because they're looking at us. Thank you.